Chapter 10, Development. Today we're going to be talking about key issue one. Why does development vary among countries? So let's introduce what development means. For a country to be developed, we have to rank them using this index we call the HDI, or the Human Development Index. Now this index has three parts. The first part is the standard of living, or how well people live in a country. Then we have things like the healthy or wealthy lifestyle. And then we have finally the access to knowledge. Now if you see right here on the right, you have three, those three indexes combined into one number, which is the HDI. And you have in the purple the developed countries, and you have in the green the developing countries. Now we put these two categories to signify how far up the HDI index a country is. So if it's low down here, in other words, if the HDI is low, that means places like Sub-Saharan Africa have a low human development. But if we go up to the top here, we notice that places in North America, for example, have a high HDI. Now we range from 0.4 to 1.0. Now if you notice here on this map we have the very highly developed regions in green and then we have the colors changing all the way down to the lowest developing regions. So if you notice there's a couple patterns here. In the northern part of North America most countries, US, Canada and even Mexico are either very highly developed or highly developed. Now if you go down to the southern hemisphere here in what we call Sub-Saharan Africa, you notice that most countries here are either low developing countries or medium developing countries. Now the same is true for most of the countries in the northern hemisphere. They're either highly developed or very highly developed and countries in the southern hemisphere are usually very medium developed or low developing nations. Now. If we look at the development regions of the world, you'll notice that there are some indexes here in each one of these squares that tell you a little bit about what world regions have what levels of development. Now inside of each region there are variations. In other words, if I zoom into the United States, not all of the US has the same levels of development. Some parts of the U United States are very developed and some are not very developed. So let's break down the three parts of the HDI. The first part was the standard of living. So even standard of living has some parts to it. For example, the standard of living is made up of the gross national income, or how much money each country makes, which is abbreviated GNI. And then we adjust that for purchasing power parity, which is the triple P per capita. Now other measures of standard of living include how many people work in primary, secondary, and tertiary economic activities, and how productive people are. In other words, how much they produce. If you look at GNI, or how much money people make on average per capita per person, along the same lines as the other map I just showed you, the Northern Hemisphere has the most GNI per capita. The Southern Hemisphere, specifically this part of Africa, has the lowest GNI per capita. But what does this mean? Well, it means that most people in these regions make very low incomes compared to people in the more developed regions, which have higher GNI per capita. If you look at this structure here, it tells you the percentage of jobs on the left axis here and the, the time period here in the bottom axis. So if you see, the primary sector jobs have been steadily declining in the developing world over the last 20 years. And they've been also steadily increasing in parts of the developed world in tertiary activities. What does this mean? It means that primary activities such as agriculture, and secondary activities such as manufacturing are actually declining across the world. But activities that involve services, like employees, like salaried employees, like doctors, nurses, teachers, etc., they're steadily increasing in the developing world and in the developed world. Productivity means, again, how much per person uh, we produce in each country. So if you look at the most developed nations of the world, they have a high productivity rate, $50 and above, for example, for the United States and Australia. But if you look at the parts of the developing world, even parts like Russia, they have low productivity measures, so below $10 per, per hour per person. This was data from 2013. The other part of the HDI is the access to knowledge, or how much access to education people have. So if you look at access to knowledge, this means how many years of school adults get how many expected years of schooling do the youth receive, the young people? And then other measures of access to knowledge include how many students per teacher are there in each classroom? And how many people know how to read and write? That's the literacy rate. So if you look at the mean years of schooling, the same, the same kind of pattern appears. 
the more people go to school, usually the more developed they are. So I'm pointing here at the United States and Canada. And you notice that the mean years of school or the average years of schooling are 10 and above. Now, if I look at places like Central America here, the uh, mean years of schooling is below 7. That means that people here tend to go to about the 7th or 8th grade on average. The expected years of schooling includes how much is the average number of 5-year-olds are expected to be in school. So for example, in the United States and Canada again, it's 14 and above. 14 years of schooling on average were expected of 5-year-olds and above. Now places like Indonesia here have a very uh, kind of medium grade expected years of schooling and then places in Sub-Saharan Africa have the lowest. The pupil to teacher ratio again means how many students to teachers there are. The lower the number of students to teacher, the better it's expected that they're going to receive an education. So the better quality education. So I have people here in the U.S., for example, receiving some of the largest, uh, some sorry, some of the smallest pupil to teacher ratios below 15. But then places in sub-Saharan Africa and places even in South Asia that have the highest number of pupil to teacher ratios. This means that classrooms here are very large compared to classrooms in the United States and even countries in South America, like here, like Venezuela, for example. The literacy rate, again, means it's the measure of how many people on average, or percentage, I'm sorry, know how to read and write. So again, it's higher above the equator. Most countries in the Northern Hemisphere have a high literacy rate, and most countries below it have a lower literacy rate. So for example, parts of Sub-Saharan Africa have below 70% literacy rates, so pretty low. So if we look at another measure of uh, the HDI, the Human Development Index, we include health as well. Health and wealth. For health, we look at life expectancy at birth. This means how many years a child that's born is expected to live. We also look at other measures of wealth, like the consumer goods they're able to purchase, the amount of cars or motor vehicles they have per every thousand people, and the literacy rate again. Believe it or not, this has to do with health as well, and I'll show you why. For developed nations of the world, the life expectancy in birth, at birth is expected to be high. In other words, it's, a, it's expected to go up to about 80 years. But for developing nations, it's about 70 years. Now this means that on average, not every person, on average, life expectancy ranges from about the mid-50s to the early 80s. Now this depends on the region of the world you live in. For example, in North America and Europe and in South Pacific, uh, South Asia, most people are expected to live close to 80 years. But if you go to the developing world, parts like Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, you're expected to, to live, I'm sorry, up to about 55, 56 years of age on average. Now, of course, motor vehicles are another measure of wealth. Now, if you have a nation with a lot of motor vehicles, that usually means that they're highly developed. So we look at nations, for example, in Europe that have 300 and above motor vehicles for every thousand people, that's a pretty high number. That means people have enough wealth to buy a motor vehicle and to use it and to maintain it. These also allow you access to a job. So if you live far away, you can actually commute using your vehicle. Cellular telephones are another measure of how we use consumer goods. So in a nation that has a high number of telephones per every thousand people, this usually also means a good measure of development. So for example, Argentina here has uh, 1,500 and above cell phones per every thousand people. That means that aids communication, that helps you communicate with others. That's another measure of development. But nations here in Sub-Saharan Africa have below 500 cell phones per thousand people. That's a low measure of development. Internet access is a very large indicator of how developed a nation is. So if you look at the developing world, most people in the developing world have access to the internet, which allows for a greater sharing of information. But if you look at the developing world, less than half of the people have access to the internet. So this is still true today in 2017. The percentage of internet users allows connectivity, allows people to communicate. So in a country with a low index of access to internet means that you have a low level of development.